A couple of other, these are just more definitions. So we have some material constants that relate stress to strain. Um, the one that you're most familiar with probably is Young's modulus, right? So Young's modulus is the 1, 1 component of stress divided by the 1, 1 component of strain. And so in a one-dimensional one tensile test, We have a bar and we pull on it, right? Well, the, the, in this case, you're only pulling on one direction, and so there's only the stress only has the one one component is the only one active, right? They're all other zeros, right? And so then you divide by the one one component of strain, plotting one one, one one, the slope of that line is the Young's modulus. Um, similarly, we talk about the volumetric strain, and I think we define the volumetric stress, but the, the volumetric stress is the average hydrostatic stress, right? So it's, it's one-third the trace of the stress tensor. So that's like the the average volumetric stress, so the average volumetric stress over the average volumetric strain gives you the bulk modulus. And again, if you plotted that, it would just be something for a linear elastic material, it would be the slope of a straight line like that. This is H for hydrostatic, which is defined as one third the trace of the stress tensor. So if a young, Young's modulus gives us a measure of the stiffness of the material. So it's a, a quantity that signifies how hard it is to stretch something in one dimension, right? That's the Young's modulus. Uh, the bulk modulus then is analogous to that, but instead of trying to stretch it in one dimension, it's a, it's a resistance to stretching in all dimensions at once, right? in three dimensions at once. Or uh, maybe in, in geomechanics, we're always talking about things that are compressive in the earth, so it, it, it may be more useful to think of about it as it's a material's resistance to, to volume change through compression. Right? So if we squeeze a material on all sides, um, you know, a, a, a material with a higher bulk modulus would be more difficult to compress than one with a lower. So, shear modulus then is a resistance to shearing. Yeah. 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 I mean, we're trying to. Yeah. These are just definitions, right. just some things that. I mean, the type yeah. of. Yeah. yeah. Because, it, you know, ultimately, yeah, to, to go back, ultimately everything in, everything in engineering goes back to basically four equations, right? Uh, conservation of energy, conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, I guess five, conservation of momentum, momentum, or angular momentum, and then, and then the, the, the last one would be the second law of thermodynamics. Which is, uh, I'm not going to say it, it's, it's, it's a much tougher concept because you have to believe in entropy, right? which is a, weird, a strange thing. Uh, but anyway, um, everything comes down to that. So, but when we're talking about mechanics, right, we're, we're often, we're mostly talking about conservation momentum, which is just the continuum or grown up version of F equals MA, right? And so we're just trying to close that problem. Relating, uh, you know, that has a stress in it. We need to relate that to displacement somehow. And it's a constitutive model that does that and allows us to solve it. So uh, shear modulus, this is just a material's resistance to shearing. We, we kind of already talked about what shearing is. But again, this is, you know, if you have a cube like this and then you deformed it into something like that, that would, that would be shear. And, and so um, the shear modulus then is 
you know, in this case, I, I've written it, I've written it for, as 1, 3, 1, 3. Uh, if the material's isotropic, meaning it has no uh, preferential planes of, uh, of symmetry, you know, I think you guys know what isotropic is from dealing with permeabilities, right? But, uh, so if the material's I isotropic, which we'll talk more about, uh, then, you know, there's only one shear modulus. So in other words, S13 would be the same as S23. It would be the same as S12. They'd all, they'd all have the same. Right? But you can't have anisotropic materials that have different shear moduli in different directions. Um, also, if, if the bulk modulus is a material's resistance to volume change, then the shear modulus is the material's resistance to shape change. Right? So if you have a pure shear scenario, like I've tried to draw that, the material doesn't actually, the volume of the material doesn't change between that configuration and that configuration. If given me loose credit for a bad, or, or my bad artistic <laughs> inability there. But, but under pure shear, the material doesn't change volume at all. It only changes shape. Uh, so then the last thing is the Poisson ratio, and it's actually, um, it's sort of a secondary uh, type thing, but uh, the easiest way to describe what it is, is it's, um, you know, if you, if you pull on a material, it will always, so if you, if you strain it in one direction, it's always going to have, like, some negative strain in the opposite direction. Uh, so, in other words, if I have something like this and I pull on it, it's going to get longer, but it's also going to get narrower. So, so the di the difference, you know, maybe I should have drawn it like this, right? like that. So it's, like it's going to get longer, but it's also going to get narrower, and that's due to the Poisson effect and the material's Poisson ratio quantifies that. And the Poisson ratio always has to be between zero and a half. Uh, and it can never be negative. Um.